I'm Erica Lukes, host of UFO Classified. For me, life isn't simply black and white. Life is full of many unknowns. It is my goal to travel the world and to work with the world's leading experts in the hopes of making groundbreaking discoveries. Join me on UFO Classified Friday nights at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, only on KCOR. Hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Good afternoon, good evening, my friends. I'm Erica Lukes, and I am always excited to, to be here with you and to get into chat and see my friends, Ken, Bruce, Jason, all of you, Mike, Doug Down Under. It means the world to me to have you here, and I can't think of a better way to spend a Friday evening than to to talk about life-changing subjects and and really put good research forward. Last week and the week before, I had... Uh, two shows that are very mind-blowing, and I hope that you get the chance to listen to them. Please share the shows, because never before has there been done an interview on Skinwalker Ranch with someone like Chris, who actually lived there for six years and worked for Bigelow Aerospace. Chris Marks was on my show twice, and I had the pleasure of meeting him, and I mentioned in one of my shows that I had his files in my hand, and I do, and they are very, very interesting. I look forward to uh, a good partnership in the future with Chris. We have amazing plans with regard to research here in Utah and archiving and all sorts of things, so I will keep you posted on that, but definitely listen to the show, share it. Uh, it it's, I have no doubt, set some people on their, their keisters. Um, I want to also take a moment to quickly address this, the idiocracy surrounding uh, the Area 51, the Storm Area 51 debacle that we're seeing unfold. I know that it's a great chance for a handful of people to make money and promote movies and do all sorts of things, but most people with uh, hopefully a brain would actually not decide to storm a, a military uh, installation. In my opinion, if you want to actually do something that is constructive with regard to finding answers about this, you might actually contribute to a radio show like UFO Classified that is a listener-supported show. You would actually support uh, UFO data. You would support uh, Project Heshtal, and there's so many great important places that deserve to have funding. And so I would definitely encourage people to to do that. And I want to just say that um, the people that are going to be out there and, and who are actually in the UFO community supporting this are not, they're not my people. I'm a little bit better. I think we're, we're all a lot better than that. Um, so there you have that. I try to every week bring you people who have critical information and I spend hours and hours finding these people, reach, researching them, talking with them. My dear friend and colleague and co-author, Gordon Lohr, who's been on my show several times, introduced me to my guest this evening. And that means a lot to me. He knows Gordon as well. My guest this evening is David J. Hogan, who worked as an executive editor in Chicago in the book publishing for 30 years. He's author of seven books and editor-in-chief of numerous others on topics including film, aviation, vintage automobiles, kind of my favorite there, weapon systems, politics, World War II, and the American West. He wrote a book that I have in my hands because he graciously sent it to me called UFO Fact. All that, all that all that's left to know about Roswell aliens, whirling discs, and flying saucers. Um, it Honestly, I have not, I will say, and I've, I've told David this a million times this week, but I have never read a book that is this complete, that gives such an incredible background about so many things involving people in the community, different research organizations here and abroad, and this is important stuff, about close encounters, uh, encounters with police officers, about some of the belief systems, the dangerous cult-like behavior that emerges from the UFO community. And I really would recommend that you go to Amazon and get this book. It is an incredible book. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on, David. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy that Gordon introduced 
introduced us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Erica. It's a treat to be here on your show. Thank you. Well, thank you. It, it, you know, like I, I it's, there's so many books that are put out right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, we see, I mean, hundreds and hundreds, and it's just sometimes you you get books and they lack so much substance. And with your book, I mean, this took you. You thought it was going to be a little bit quicker to get this done, but it took mm-hmm. you 18 months when you got in there to actually complete Yes, yeah, I could book. typically write a book in oh, eight to 10 months, maybe. <clears throat> and, and, and as a science fiction kid uh, out of the early 1960s, I, I mean, it's a subject that always intrigued me, of course. And I just pitched it to my publisher and they said, okay, and I signed the contract, and and I started researching, and uh, pretty darn quickly I thought, "Holy smoke, this is a huge topic," and I kind of wondered exactly what I got myself into, and it did take me eighteen months, and uh, I, I am not a ufologist. I'm a a a, a, a professional writer. And uh, I thought that I had known a lot about the subject, and I got into this, and as I just said, um, it just floored me. It is so broad and wide and fascinating, and um, uh, I ended up wanting to make the book a single-volume handbook about the UFO phenomenon. And um, I think I succeeded. I would hope that you would agree. I want to just say, you know, when when I looked at the book the first time, because you sent it to me this week, and I've been just Mm. my head has been down the whole time. I am I'm shocked at what I'm learning. And for somebody who really cares about the integrity of the subject, it is important for me to know about all of the organizations here and abroad and to look at some of the political uh, motivations or some of the people that inserted themselves into this community back in the 50s and 60s that were maybe perhaps delusional or politically motivated. <laughs> and, and you've just captured all of this brilliantly. Um, it, it. It's a story of long standing, and of course, it really took off after the Second World War. Um, 1947 is Kenneth Arnold, and it's also uh, uh, the mystery at Roswell. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of people will say that, well, it's an outgrowth of uh, of the anxieties of the Second World War. And the atomic bomb and the people uh, thought more and more oh, keenly about science and its destructive potential. And then they were also looking, you know, at the sky. Uh, science fiction had, had positive space travel for ages, of course. And immediately after the war, that seemed to be getting closer and closer. Uh, the, the Germans had... I was certainly perfected the V2 uh, uh, rocket, and it's an ICBM essentially. And, um, and 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 I think the critics of the UFO movement are a little too quick to say that the interest in UFOs is a simple expression of anxiety. Um, I call myself an optimistic skeptic on the subject. Um, I'm again, you know, I'm a science fiction kid and I grew up watching this island earth and the war of the worlds and the original thing. And, uh, and I read, uh, I'm inside the spaceships. It's the famous George Adamski book, probably around 1962 or three. And that was nine or 10 then. And it certainly piqued my interest, and um, it is vital, I think, to be open-minded on the subject. Um, uh, There are people who are absolutely dead set against 
the idea of UFOs. Um, and I think that is, I mean, it's an untenable position to take. It's a little bit like an atheist. Uh, right. um, atheism, it's as much uh, an expression of faith as is devout belief. <laughs> and I don't think atheists understand that. And I don't think that the firmly anti-UFO faction really gets that either. Uh, and then that being said, I am a believer I mean, empirical evidence, and uh, I'm obviously the strongest proponents of UFOs have have firm scientific backgrounds and, um, I mean, as we say, credentials. Uh, I mean, that certainly helps. Um, it's a, it's a and, good thing, especially in this this field, because you and I both know, and you point this out in your book, that there are charlatans and and people that simply uh, are delusional and and use this as a, a means to make money. To you know, I, it's just, it's really interesting, but it is like you said, it is it is a topic that deserves to be really investigated rationally, with one foot on the ground, maybe. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm at the very beginning of my book. I, I, uh, uh, I talk about a summer night I spent on a deck at a house. Uh, I'm in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And I was just looking at the night sky. And, and I was listening to the frogs and the katydids and the far-off barking dogs. And I just thought, this is all about life and I am life. And I looked up at the sky and I saw airliners and a satellite and a meteorite. And I saw Venus and Jupiter on the horizon. Uh, and the mysteries that are out there are so profound. And I know that there are other intelligent eyes out there observing something similar. Um, but uh, it's all about the great distances involved. And I don't know, maybe later the listeners can help us with this, but uh, I, I don't know if we are ever actually going to find each other. What do you think? You know, I don't know, and I, I think the more if we talked about this, you know, briefly, the more I look into this topic, and the more that I experience personally, you know, the less I I go down the the extraterrestrial road, you know. And I think I I I, I always think it's fascinating to look back at when the ETH was inserted into the narrative, who was behind it. Was there a bigger reason? Was it a distraction? You know, I, mean, I, I think mm -hmm. there is so many. It's my guest, Chris Marks, last week mentioned, you know, when you look at a place like Skinwalker Ranch or you look at uh, Yakima or Piedmont, Missouri, you're seeing all different types of, of things happening. And is that all extraterrestrial? I mean, I, nobody knows. And so for people to to label it as A, B, C, and D, I think that's not necessarily a helpful thing. I mean, we, I believe, I mean, we have enough evidence here when you look at some of the important research that has been done to say that there is an intelligence that is interacting with us. But where, mm -hmm. what its origins are, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and our, our attempts at explanations uh, can be confusing. I, mean, I think that you just mentioned EMH, uh, I'm electromagnetic. Uh, uh, Hypothesis, and 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 then there's the EMR, uh, 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 the electromagnetic radiation hypothesis, and then some people are interested in those uh, as not only um, indicators of UFOs, but of things like poltergeists, and and if you start bringing in things out of left field. Uh, I mean, as interesting as that may be, um, 
I think it undercuts the legitimacy of serious UFO study. I absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly. And so sometimes when I look at uh, organizations um, or people that are promoting um, some of these things that are pushing us down, in my opinion, a dangerous path, I just think, oh, Lord, you know, we've got a lot of a lot of work to do and people need to be educated and people need to, and, and I know it's hard and I will say for me because I've had very profound experiences in my life and I finally decided to do something. I joined MUFON, became state director, and I quickly learned that that just wasn't an organization. You know, I mean, I at the end of the day, that's not an organization that I feel is truly beneficial. I, there are many good people in it. They, they will always be my friends and I'll support them individually. But I think when you're supporting some of the things and having speakers on your lineup that are, you know, that are talking about the secret space program and, and some of these things, and then also interjecting religious beliefs, you know, this is their oh, yeah. demons, you know, the evil demonic, blah, blah, blah. And you just think, Wow, this is, I don't know. I think I'll lock myself in the closet, maybe have a margarita. I'm not quite sure, but. <laughs> uh, I have a section in the book about cults. And, and they talk in particular about uh, 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 Marshall Applewhite in Heaven's Gate in 1978. And the upshot of that is that 38 people killed themselves. I'm expecting to be transported to a better place on a spaceship. Um, and Applewhite fit the profile of a cult leader, male, middle-aged, uh, highly intrusive into the lives of his disciples. Um, uh, 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 appropriating their money and their will. And, uh, there's a great tragedy in that, uh, and that this fellow was probably demented, and uh, and and he had powers of persuasion such that he was able to convince a couple score of people to die with him, um, and then fortunately things like Heaven's Gate, end up being folded into the larger UFO narrative. And so for the lay person, if you say UFO, perhaps they'll think pretty quickly of Heaven's Gate and then just dismiss the whole idea. And um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's so unfortunate. And I certainly don't like exploiters or takers, uh, uh, and yet they do often insinuate themselves into the UFO movement. And uh, uh, although it's on the fringes, it's on the fringes, uh, 38 people dead, that's a big deal, isn't it? It is, and I will say that, you know, with the Heaven's Gate, uh, all of... All of that, um, it is my understanding that Art Bell played a, a role in kind of promoting some of this. And I, to my knowledge, after after the suicides took place, I don't think he ever made a public statement about that. But again, you know, you take oh, really? a lot of responsibility uh, at being a leader in, you know, or, or trying to be a public personality in this field because you do have people that um, – are are looking for answers. Some people are mentally unbalanced and and just looking for a community. And they don't. They will really kind of glom on to anything that's put before them. And that's what you know. I I try to to bring on people like you so I can educate people and hopefully give them a little bit of of strength and 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 power of discernment. You know, because it is it is dangerous. Oh, sure. A really gray, murky area, and prime for the picking from people that are are not necessarily the best human beings. Yes, I think a particularly um, unfortunate aspect of that is uh, the legitimate, serious-minded UFO researchers 
are often marginalized or even mocked. Uh, um, I I have a lot of admiration uh, uh, for James McDonald, a uh, uh, atmospheric physicist and a uh, an excellent researcher. I'm dedicated to observation. Uh, uh, and he was wary of eyewitness accounts. Uh, he asked for more solid scientific information than that. <clears throat> and, and he appeared, um, I'm in front of Congress in the early 1970s. I'm in the hearings on the SST. Um, supersonic transport, and the particular congressman turned the conversation into McDonald's uh, 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 sincere interest. I mean UFOs, and then what happened is uh, that the entire you know hearing ended up laughing at this man, and 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 and. and and he committed suicide in 1971 uh, uh, after being investigated by the FBI uh, and laughed at publicly. And that's a great tragedy. And uh, I'm again, uh, uh, although I am an optimistic skeptic, uh, I admire a James McDonald and people like him who are dedicated uh, to the scientific method, observation. Um, and if the, uh, if the whole discipline I mean, is going to thrive, it just has to um, embrace more of that. Uh, uh, the risks notwithstanding. Absolutely. And, and that is you so beautifully put, and I couldn't agree more. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. We're going to take our first break, but I want to just thank David Hogan and I want to for being here, but I also want to thank Gordon Lore for arranging this. And Gordon, I hope you are listening. If not, then I'll call you after the show. But anyway, David, thank you for being here. I will put links to your book on, on my website and also well, in you. chat. And we're going to take our break. We will be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Toxins are everywhere, from the air we breathe to the food we eat and the water we drink. In a world where 80,000 known toxins and heavy metals threaten our very existence, how are you going to protect yourself and your loved ones? Introducing Pure Body Extra Strength, the world's first collodial zeolite that helps trap and remove toxins as well as heavy metals from your body that are messing with your memory, clarity, sleep, and focus. Don't just take our word for it or the testimonials from our thousands of happy customers. Check out the hundreds of articles and case studies on the National Institute of Health website proving Zeolite's powerful ability to remove toxins. For a limited time, listeners to KCOR will receive 10% off their first order. To get started, go to trypurebody.com and enter promo code RADIO10. Again, that's trypurebody.com. Toxic junk is all around us, but now you can take back control of your health and protect yourself by detoxing with Pure Body Extra Strength. You'll be on your way to sleeping better, thinking more clearly, and feeling more energetic. Go to trypurebody.com right now and get started today now broadcasting in digital hd radio in the shadows a voice cries out evidence that you're not alone you said my name what is your name proof that the living and the dead coexist or do they Every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, join writer, producer, and paranormal investigator Greg Bakken on Ghost Box Radio. 
as he explores, interviews, and investigates evidence, alongside some of the best in the paranormal community and beyond. Six people killed. Ghost Box Radio, Wednesday nights exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network, because the dead don't sleep. Ghost Box Radio. We interrupt to bring you this. Would you like to advertise on KCOR Digital Radio Network? (laughs) This is what I'm talking about. At a fraction of the cost of traditional radio advertising, why not? Tell them the good news. Whether you need to promote your next book, product, or service, we can customize a package for just about any budget. Finally, there is hope for the hopeless. Why limit yourself to a tiny local market when KCOR can brand you to the world? Here's all you do. Visit KCORradio.com or contact our sales department by email at saleskcorradio.com. We want it now! 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 See the difference with us by letting us work for you. This ain't reality TV! The KCOR Digital Radio Network. Are you ready to go? Turn the radio It's showtime! Here we go, world! You're listening to the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Broadcasting from the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. Their base is so large it has to draw most of its power from the nearby nuclear fusion plant. The future of radio is here and now. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I'm always happy to be here. And I love, like I always say, looking in chat and seeing everyone. Bruce, congratulations on your upcoming interview. That is fantastic. I know you work really hard at at, at promoting this and doing research. So congratulations. I want to, again, just express my utter dismay at the Storm Area 51 Thing and want to just throw out there that I hope none of you, and I'm assuming that my audience is far too intelligent for that kind of nonsense, but that you're not going to uh, go there. It is, it's ridiculous. Yes, it is fun to go to the little alien inn. I've been there and I love the people there and it is a great, it's a great road trip, but I think the whole sentiment behind this, uh, this, whatever this is taking place is really Distasteful, and I think at the end of the day, it was probably manipulated by those who maybe don't have the best intention for people or are trying to cash in on it. What do you think? I don't know. Um, my guest this evening is David J. Hogan. I was introduced to him by Gordon Lore. He is an author who has written seven books one of which is my new favorite that I'm recommending besides Gordon's book. Um, And so I'm posting the links to that. It is UFO facts um, and it's all the things uh, left to know about Roswell, aliens, rolling discs and flying saucers. And I will tell you, if you are just starting in this field and you need a really good primer, or even if you're like me and you've been in this field for a long time, you're going to find things in here that are really crucial to your learning. Uh, And I, I, I really support this book 100%. And I actually, David, I need to send this to you and get it autographed. So I would love to do that. So I can put it in my archive. That would be really cool. I but signed a few books in my time. Sure. That, well, Thank I'm you very sure. much. That's flattering. And, and, you know, you have, I mean, you've, you've got such a, a wide area of interest. And I love that. And if people are just tuning in, which I can see they are, um, you, you began. Really, you've always you loved sci-fi. You got into this back in '62, '63, and you have written this book, which took 18 months to write, and that is very impressive. And you can see when you look through it that it is truly you don't you didn't miss it, anything. But before we uh, left for break, you were talking about James McDonald, 
and yes. his importance and how much he really, you know, what a, what an incredible human being. And he sacrificed so much and had a, a professional career and at the end of the day uh, ended up committing suicide. And that was a, a tremendous loss. I know when I was in L.A. visiting Gordon Lohr, he, he was friends with James and was with him, you yes. know, a month before he passed away. And that when they all got the news, I mean, that absolutely devastated them because he was not only a wonderful person, but had contributed and sacrificed so much in the name of good, credible research. And I, I want to just stress to people who want to believe and, and are just jumping off every bridge and supporting delusional ideas and things that they're not really uh, researching, I, I want to stress that that impacts people who are doing critical and grounded work for this subject. So we have a responsibility as, as human beings who are looking into this to try to step it up. And I appreciate you you mentioning that. Thank you very much. And, you know, also Heaven's Gate. But let's, you know, continue talking about McDonald and, and some of those the people that you saw that sacrificed so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I really got into the book, you know, I did develop a little roster of heroes, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, oh, I guess that McDonald is, is is at the top of my list. Um, it's certainly profound if if you are driven to suicide. Um, uh, now, part of that also was domestic trouble in his life. But um, I can't imagine being laughed at in public by Congress. Uh, and it's not even the reason for your visit, but a congressman brings up the UFO thing, and then they mock you. Um, and uh, uh, I don't use the word martyr lightly. and. And I don't know if Mr. McDonald is a martyr. Uh, he certainly suffered for what he believed in, though. Um, and so as I got into the book, um, I did develop a uh, an interesting list of heroes. I'm obviously J. Allen Hynek uh, at, at the Center for UFO Studies. I'm outstanding astronomer. Uh, uh, I admire Donald Kehoe. Uh, I'm involved in NICAP as the director. And uh, uh, I also admire uh, my friend Gordon Lohr and Richard Hall at NICAP, who had to deal not only with skeptics, but with the actual physical intrusion of the CIA um, in 1969. Uh, uh, I find Carl Jung fascinating, too. Uh, his extended essay called Flying Saucers has seen publication as a book, and and, and he was interested in in the social and the folkloric um, commonalities of UFO sightings, and, and and is certainly very influential in the field. Um, uh, Edgar Mitchell, I think he was the fifth or sixth man on the moon, uh, and 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 a great proponent of a manned space program. Uh, and although he never witnessed the UFO himself, he, uh, he, he felt that, uh, that the Roswell incident did involve extraterrestrials. I'm interested in our military activity there. Um, uh, uh, Carl Sagan, I'm another obvious hero here, uh, really wedded to the scientific method 
and logic and empirical evidence. And he had very little patience for things like magic and demons and faith healing and channeling. Uh, uh, he saw not a lot of of evidence about UFOs that satisfied him, but he was always open to the idea of it. Um, all sorts of uh, of, uh, of heroes and leading lights I discovered. Well, and, and I love uh, Carl Jung. I mean, I've, I've, I have so many of, of, I've got a lot of his books and I really think he was a fascinating individual. Um, and I, I want to just say that when you mentioned that, I was, I had said this a few times, but I was with Gordon and he has a, a, a signed letter from Jung sitting right at his computer. Oh my. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. And so that, I mean, oh that's just, it's, it was really just something to, to behold. Um, and, and yeah, like you said, that interest. And I think the sixties was such a, a fascinating and pivotal time for the subject. And we, we really haven't seen such uh, good work, uh, the credible people in the subject, in my opinion, since the sixties. So it, I'm wondering, really- I'm wondering if part of that, uh, I mean, because in spite of the political difficulties of that decade, it also was um, economically, Sound and thriving, and uh, people felt optimistic. And and if you're optimistic, I think that your imagination is ignited. Uh, and and so that may be a reason why the 1960s ended up producing a lot of uh, of good thought about the subject. Uh, and and then come the 1970s. Um, it's such a down decade, you know, it's the hangover of the 1960s. I'm a lot of bad hair and <laughs> cars and clothes. And Well, there were some kind of cool cars back in the 70s, you have to admit, you know. <laughs> well, a few. You have to be, uh, although after, after the muscle cars vanished after about 1973, Good point. it got a little bleak. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you on that one. Now that now that you mentioned it, I totally agree. But I I want to I I want to go back b- before I forget uh, to the fact that the CIA infiltrated NICAP and shut it down because yeah. this is one of those yeah, stories that you know I mean you talk to different people and 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 people have definite ideas on that and some people are so rigid in their thought process they think that absolutely is a just a load and having listened to Gordon and having done research and having uh, you know, I mean, I think I'm pretty adept at this. That absolutely did happen. So will you tell us, give us a little bit of background on what happened in those days at NICAP? Well, it was a, uh, um, not a marginal organization, but one that was always kind of scrabbling for funds and it was headed up for a while. Uh, uh, by Major Kehoe, uh, who is a very interesting man, and um, um, in spite of being underfunded and not particularly well publicized, it did um, ignite the interest of the CIA. Uh, uh, and so now, let's be honest: the inner workings and the motivations of the CIA really have to be unknowable to most of us. Uh, I probably can't imagine what they're up to or interested in. And I'm a pretty imaginative fellow. Uh, but for some reason, uh, uh, there was something about NICAP, perhaps the organization's interest in empirical evidence and simple truth uh, that interested the CIA. And uh, uh, I spoke about this with Gordon Lore at great length, and 
And, uh, I mean, there were, uh, um, agency infiltrators on staff at NICAP. And then one day in 1969, uh, uh, the agency or, um, its representatives, um, uh, uh, physically showed up at the offices and said, uh, all right, goodbye. Um, this is all finished. And so just leave all of your files here. It, it's all stuff that we will take care of and look after. Don't worry about it. Uh, and so what was their interest in it? Uh, is it something extraterrestrial or is it the NICAP had simply gotten too close to earthly secret. Uh, and uh, uh, among the many reasons I admire Gordon Lohr is that he, he uh, uh, doesn't really posit an answer to that. Uh, I mean, it simply happened. Uh, and so all of that information all those files, you know, are at Langley, you know, or at some off-site archives. Uh, but why? I don't know. Uh, uh, have you a guess about that? You know what? I, 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 I think. Yeah, I think that they were doing an incredible work. I think that they were. They were onto a lot of things. I think that, you know, it's such a gray area when you get uh, the intelligence community involved in things. And I think that, you know, of course, they're 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 getting involved to see, you know, if if there are people from foreign governments that are getting involved and too close to information. And then you've got the fact that there are people that are in this subject that are completely off the rockers and are a threat uh, to other people. But I think with with NICAP, they had some important information, and they were getting, they were getting a lot of it, and there was a need to shut it down. And you, you know, you listen to Gordon Lore, who has talked on my show about Stuart Nixon that came in, and mm-hmm. and you know, by some accounts from people that were uh, loosely involved at NICAP at the time, they said that Stuart Nixon was just an idiot, and. You know, I mean, from from my understanding in talking to people in the intelligence community, you know, it's sometimes you put a useful idiot in, and guess what? People that are involved in intelligence know how to act. I don't know. Call me crazy. Oh, but, yeah. You know, <laughs> so it's yeah. the thought that, that that didn't happen when you've got all the evidence that it did is is quite interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, uh uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, 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 many sort of strong arm tactics are loathsome. Um, and although we do live in a democracy, <clears throat> it's a little fragile. Um, and some people might say it's even more fragile lately. Um, uh, it is difficult to have oversight over organizations like the CIA. I mean, I mentioned that I'm understanding the importance of the CIA. Uh, 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 there is that concept of real politique and, and, and our country does have to maintain its eyes and ears around the world. Uh, there are honest to goodness threats out there. Uh, I just wonder though, how, how truly threatening NICAP was. You know, it is, it is interesting. And I will tell you, I, um, when I had the opportunity to look through Gordon's files, you know, which most people have not seen. (laughs) And I, I feel absolutely honored that he is, he has given me his files 
Um, and that is a, just an honor and I will cherish them forever and make sure people see them. But, it, you know, to look through and see his exchanges and Richard Hall's exchanges with people on the board and all of these things that went on. I mean, this was really a volatile uh, period in time and there, you know, Gordon and several of the people that were there and they knew that this was a, uh, that the CIA was involved. I mean, they spent a great deal of time getting these files and taking them out of NICAP headquarters and Xerox in them. So they would go to, oh, yeah. you know, so they would find a place that wouldn't, you know, all the information wouldn't disappear. And so, that was that must have been a very intense time period for all of them. Well, it's also a very heroic act. Also, um, uh, uh, you probably don't want to piss off the CIA, uh, uh, but Gordon and Richard uh, were willing to risk that. Uh, and I do remember Gordon telling me how frantically. Uh, 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 the Xerox machine was just, you know, whirring, 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 working, working, working for hours and hours and hours. File, file, page, page, copy it, copy it, save it, save it. Um, uh, and it's invaluable information, of course. Uh, um, I don't know, in a democracy, perhaps the public has as much right uh, to this material as the agency does. Um, uh, I don't think any of us enjoy functioning as citizens in ignorance. Uh, and, and so people like Gordon and Richard are, are, are honest to goodness heroes. And I absolutely agree with you. And it, it was, it's interesting to see that, you know, even now when, when, uh, word got out about Gordon, um, giving me his files and trusting me with his files, I mean, there were, uh, people, individuals, entities, whatever you want to call them, that popped their ugly little heads up, uh, trying to get that information. And, and there is, a, a huge uh, underground network, or maybe not so underground, that is uh, has a lot of funding behind them, that, and they're trying to, to sweep up all all of these files. And it is incredible to watch. And I will definitely have more information that I will be putting forward because I've been researching this and the players and and all of these things for a long, long time. But it's you know, I it, it's funny that even after all these years. You know, Gordon's files are still of value, and and people that are uh, playing in the shadows still want that information. Yeah, it just dawned on me. It's fifty years now, isn't it? Nineteen sixty-nine. Yeah, yep, uh, you're right. Uh, 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 I was in high school then, and I'm a grandfather now. How about that? But uh, uh, I'm mean, still relevant. It's still of interest. Um, uh, I think it's incumbent, though, on all of us always to question why our institutions are interested in things. Um, it's very easy to be, you know, middle class. It's even easier if you're white and upper middle class just to kind of sit around and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take the boat out on Saturdays and enjoy the big screen TV and not think about anything very much. And um, it's a good life, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, uh, there is perfidy out there uh, and, uh, and systems that are dedicated not to you, as they may claim, but to their own perpetuation. Uh, uh, and that's not to say that the CIA and 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 other government organizations are not doing uh, 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 useful and vital work. They certainly are. But you have to be realistic about this stuff. Uh, and I think, as you have to be realistic about the entire 
width and breadth of claims about UFOs. Uh, 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 there is no black and white in this world. It's a gray world, isn't it? it you know, it is, and you, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, am, I feel... I, I strongly support people in the intelligence community. And I, when I talk about, you know, that this, I, w- I want to make sure that people understand that I, I know that they're, they put their lives on the line and they, it's, it, it's incredible, but it is also interesting to see how um, intelligence agencies and also private contractors uh, insert themselves into this and try to sweep up information or, you know, do do different things to manipulate the the community, to manipulate the data, to do all of these things. And to me, that's been probably one of the most disturbing things that I have uncovered or found, you know, with regard to this. And it's there's 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 something that we that deserves to be studied. And at some point in time, somehow, some way, we're going to find a, a, a path to do that and to get information out to the public. I definitely don't think, um, and I want to talk to you about this a little bit later, but to, to just kind of broach the topic of what's happening now with To the Stars and Tom DeLonge and this new push for putting information forward and, and this is this disclosure, whatever we're calling it, because that would be interesting to get your take, but I am mm-hmm. I just, and this is a great conversation and I'm really happy to have you here. And I want to tell people to go to Amazon and posting the link for your book, UFO facts, all that's left to know about Roswell aliens, whirling discs and flying saucers. I'm here with David J. Hogan. We're going to take a break and we will be right back. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is UFO Classified. Live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Luke's upcoming guests as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the saucer. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO, and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left, and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I want to encourage you, if you've not heard my past two shows, to get in there and listen to my show with Christopher Marks. This was a groundbreaking interview um, with somebody that spent six years at Skinwalker Ranch and has had experiences that are really profound and incredible. And, And a person, Chris, who also came forward because he saw all of this disinformation and nonsense that was taking place and really affecting the community. And that is, is most unfortunate, but I admire him for, for coming forward. Please listen to those interviews and share them, get them out there. This is information that some people who dominate the subject do not want to be out there. So I'm just going to throw that out there to you. I want to thank all of my supporters 
Northern UFOs, you are the best. And this is a listener supported show. Northern UFOs, Bruce Cornett. I mean, they, I appreciate everything that you do to keep me on the air because paying for a show every Friday for five years has been, as a single mother and a business owner, it has been a difficult pursuit. But I care about this topic and we deserve the truth. We deserve good information and we're simply not getting it. So, I, I'm happy to be here. Um, I am here with someone tonight, and this is, again, one of those fascinating conversations that I'm going to have to listen to time and time again because there's so many little uh, areas that we could we could move through, and we need to have David back on the show to talk about this. Um, he wrote a book called UFO Facts, uh, All That's Left to Know About Roswell, Aliens, Rolling Discs, and Flying Saucers. I was introduced to David by my friend and co-author Gordon Lore. We've talked about Gordon in the first uh, bit of the, the, the conversation, but we've also been talking about some of the manipulation and and people that have bravely sacrificed their careers uh, and have really received poor treatment. And there are people like that that I I think we need to respect and we need to remember. And so it was wonderful to talk about James McDonald. If you don't know who he is, I would definitely recommend you find out about his life and his incredible work, uh, Gordon Lore as well, and learn about NICAP because that was an important organization to still, uh, Fran Ridge has taken over NICAP and, and we still have a lot of go- good work being done. So I just, David, again, thank you for, for talking about some of these topics because some people don't want to go there, but th- this is important. This is important for the integrity of the subject. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, and if I could bring up something that you mentioned right before the break, uh, and it was in connection with the CIA, and 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 then you mentioned contractors, and those are are uh, uh, peripheral players, and and they're hired to do a job, and and they insinuate themselves into the larger narrative. Uh, uh, think of Blackwater. I'm in the present day, um, and uh, if you allow outside players into something that's as uh, as delicate, if that's the right word, um, as UFO studies, uh, the information, uh, uh, the basic information, ends up being distorted and and is diluted. Um, it can even be turned uh, uh, to purposes that the originators of the information uh, uh, had never dreamt of. Uh, 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 UFO studies and the U.S. government are inextricably linked. And uh, uh, on balance, that's, uh, it's inevitable, but it's probably not a good thing either. And that the government obviously has its own agenda. And like the CIA, and, uh, uh, like the CIA's, a lot of that agenda is a little bit opaque. Uh, uh, and and then if you do bring in outsiders, um, you know it's like a mirror that's been improperly ground, and then you can look into it, and it's not an accurate picture of what's happening anymore. Uh, and 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 there is a lot of misinformation in the UFO. Uh, mm, history community uh and a lot of it is from the intrusiveness of government um and uh, you know to, I mean, as with the cia you know obviously our government congress the white house and so on and so forth you know have 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 
obvious value. But always be careful about these people because they don't care about you and they don't care about the truth either. Um, so anything that they say, uh, I swallow it with that proverbial grain of salt. Uh, it ain't necessarily so. You know, absolutely. And I think that's the thing that people don't understand, you know, we're in, in the UFO community. It's like they think that, oh, this was something that just happened back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, no, <laughs> this is there is more of a threat, in my opinion, right now, because there you have social media, you have a means to access people's thoughts because they're spilling everything out on Facebook and where the sightings are taking place and their beliefs and da 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 da. And then you get all of these, you know, people that are creating these fake uh, social media platforms to lure people in, to get their information, to manipulate their thought process. And it's just like, whoa. And so is this, you know, I mean, are, you know, it, what's, what, what is this about? And is are there? I mean, obviously there are other governments involved that have a, uh, a mm-hmm. stake in this interest. But what did you, when in, in your research with booked, what did you notice with regard to that? And maybe other governments kind of inserting themselves into the narrative. Um, if I go backtrack a little bit, um, as recently as thirty thirty five years ago. Um, fringe thought on any subject was pretty much restricted to ditto, to mimeograph, to hectograph, uh, a very limited circulation, um, um, even carbon copies of typewritten pages. Uh, And then since the mid-1990s, it's all different, isn't it? social media, uh, 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 the interweb, you know, all that. And uh, there is something really seductive about seeing something set in type uh, that looks clean and smooth and slick. Uh, And if you're not careful, it's going to be, you know, hey, I, yeah, it seems reasonable to me. Uh, I'm earlier in. Uh, I'm in the week. I uh, uh, I mentioned something to you about a. I'm an odd boy UFO side, uh, uh, quite popular, and and it ran a photograph that had been snapped by the Mars lander, and this website had the shot, and it said. Uh, hey, check it out. That's a squirrel on Mars. <laughs> By God, that's a squirrel. And and if you're thinking, okay, squirrel in your mind's eye, then that rock, okay, you know, it could maybe possibly kind of sort of be a squirrel. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but this site, I suspect, is serious about this. I mean, unless it's just juking all of us, I don't know. But uh, uh, I look at the at the visitor comments about this, and people are going, "Damn, that's a squirrel!" I bet Mars. I bet it's like it's teeming with squirrels. How come we don't know this? <laughs> Oh, dear. Well, that sums it up. You know, so that's social media. Uh, uh, And then you mentioned foreign governments. Um, As as I think most of us understood after after the 2016 election, foreign governments are pretty good at manipulating the thought of folks in other nations. Uh, um, and it's not a question of foolishness, really. It's 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 a little bit of laziness, I suppose. And uh, 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 people are inclined to to swallow stuff 
if it looks good. You know, if it's visually smooth and slick, and so, you know, if other governments, you know, are agitating about this and that vis-a-vis UFOs, um, it's easy to be snookered, uh, and 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 just kind of go, yeah, that's reasonable, huh? Yeah, okay, fine, yeah, I believe that, sure. Um, yes. But it's always about motive, though. You know, always, yeah. if you're able to think, think up to that next level, I mean, think about, okay, motive. Why are they telling us this or that? Uh, uh, what do they want? And what are the consequences for me? Uh, uh, Americans are uh, are sweet natured <laughs> and uh, uh, probably too kind, and it is easy for us, I think, to accept ideas and presentations that are just a little bit a little bit suspect. Um, so uh, yeah. everybody has an agenda. You know, I have an agenda. You know, I want to sell more copies of my book. That's why I'm on your show, right? You know, I also like you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, everyone has a motive, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and, and that's the thing. They're, yeah, they're, they do. It's, it's, it is so interesting to see the motivations. And it, it I think that's the thing for me because I have had – experiences because I know that there is something because I I care about the people that listen to my show. I care about, you know, when I go to a lecture and there are people coming up to me and talking about their experiences that were very real and life changing to them. It's like I I just I care um I care about that all of that and it is so disheartening to see uh, the manipulation of the subject and to see that, you know, people, unfortunately, we look, we, we turn to ufology or the leaders in ufology for for answers and support and help. And we get nothing, nothing. Not We don't even have people here who are willing to stand up for ethics or professional behavior. It's just, it's a really sad thing. But then, you know, you look at the bigger picture and how are we being manipulated by different private contractors or governments and things. And it's, it's like, I think, and I've been stressing this more and more in each of my shows at the end of the day, if you've had an experience, you know, hold that close to your chest, keep it very dear to you and don't look to anyone else to validate you or to tell you what you experienced, you know, and I don't know. It's, it's just one of those things I get very passionate about because I care. I care about the people involved in this. So, well, um, uh, uh, it is hugely important. Uh, um, I think that you mentioned life changing experiences. Uh, 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 it, it it's pretty easy, I think, to dismiss the experience of other people. Um, if you don't find them credible or if you find them unsympathetic in some way, but, uh, you know, as it relates, um, uh, uh, to UFO study, it's, as you expressed it, it's a life changing experience. And so it's incumbent on anyone with a serious interest in the subject to take these people seriously. And maybe they are stuffed full of blueberry muffins. I don't know. But maybe they're absolutely dead on. And so listen to these people. uh, uh, Think carefully about what they have to say. Uh, And then maybe you can find a bit of a reflection of your own experiences and theirs. Absolutely. I like that. That's good. And, and so, you know, I have to 
ask, you know, when you get back to looking at the book and how, you know, when you first started this, you obviously, you've loved this since you were a child. You love that science fiction. Yeah. And, and you were, you, you dug into this and you found out that this is a, there's a lot of a lot of meat behind the subject. A lot of really interesting places <laughs> yeah. you could go. But I mean, did your what did your beliefs, uh, your thought processes, did they change from when you first started the book to when you finished? And what did you, if, if they did, how did you, what 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 swayed you when you were looking at the research? I think I wound up with a greater respect for people. Uh, and, uh, I'm not exactly a misanthrope or anything like that. You know, I'm a father and a member of my community and my church and all that stuff. And, uh, uh, I get a little discouraged about people sometimes, but as I really got into this book, uh, I'm over those 18 months <laughs> of intensive research you know, I understood that that other people feel their experiences as strongly as I do, and, and um, I don't know if that's called empathy or sympathy or or simple understanding, but uh, that's probably uh, the biggest thing I learned as I worked on, on this book. Uh, uh, that people can be very, very thoughtful and invested. And if you don't listen to them, if you don't take them seriously, you know, at the, you know, at that, uh, uh, from the jump, you know, um, it's an insult to them. And then you're also depriving yourself of, of of understanding, of information, uh, you know, of insights into people. Uh, uh, eyewitness accounts of UFOs uh, are fascinating. Uh, a lot of them, I feel, are uh, are. I have to find the right word here. Not misguided, but uh, uh, I, I don't know what the heck the word is. But, uh, you know, I think any police officer will tell you that often eyewitness accounts are are highly suspect. But these people, the honest ones, saw what they saw, and they're telling us about it. And so listen to them and then use, you know, what we loosely call the scientific method and see if you can come to grips with all of it. Uh, and so that's what I've learned, that there are a lot of sincere people with experiences and ideas that are not easy to absorb right away but they deserve our attention. And I, I love that, that you could, you know, do such research and, and dig into things and you still, you know, you, you understand that even though you're a skeptical believer, <laughs> that, that <laughs> there are, that, that people are having, uh, even though some are misguided and some are, are you know, I mean, you, you mentioned to me privately at an experience you had uh, and it, it turned out to be something that was identifiable, but we all, we, we all do that. And that's part of the great beauty for me is to have, I've learned so much about the natural world. I've learned so much about aviation. I've learned so much. I mean, all of these mm -hmm. things. And it's like, I, so, I mean, great. So you go out there and you misidentify something and you think it's a UFO, but then you learn it's not. And you learn how to empower yourself and find the tools to do good investigations. And then when you do have something that takes place that is truly anomalous, it's like, wow, okay, that totally rocks. And there are people that are having these experiences. And so I, for me, I think it is really um, 
it's important to to give people good information to empower them and and your book is a brilliant example of doing that I, I think the key element of the scientific method uh, is mistakes and misapprehensions. I think that's how the scientific method works. Uh, and there's no embarrassment in being, I'm in quotes, wrong or, or mistaken about something. Um, it's all part of the path of evidence. And uh, I have never seen a UFO, uh, and I would love to see one. Uh, and if and when I do, um, I certainly hope that people give me the benefit of the doubt about my sincerity uh, and that I'm not a crank. Uh, 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 most people... Uh, who see sightings are not cracks. Um, and so give them the benefit of the doubt and then think about it. And, 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 and then maybe they're off base, but then again, maybe they're really onto something. I don't know. Uh, 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 as I started the book, I tried not to have you know, a dogmatic point of view. Oh, and I've got, we're going to cut you off right there, but I, we will be back and, and get into that a little bit more. I'm Erica Lukes here with sure. David J. Hogan. Stick around. We've got one more segment. We'll be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. 9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Your journey from the land of the living to the afterlife starts here. The Weird Tales Radio Show. Thursdays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Your weekly fix for ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, and folklore. Hosted by the sometimes werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Charles Christian. And his co-host, Janie Christian. Janie Christian. The Weird Tales Radio Show is an off-the-wall, fabulously atmospheric, and radio magazine formatted show. Rated as one of the UK's most listened to podcasts. Guests. If you're a fan of the weird and unusual, then tune in if you dare. Dear, 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 dear. Thursdays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. The Weird Tales Radio Show. The one show that takes your fears of the unknown and spins them into reality. The Weird Tales Radio Show on the KCOR Digital Radio Network, where the weird and the strange come out to play. <laughs> <laughs> Vegas, baby! Vegas' number one source for talk and new music. How cool is that? There is a world outside that which we live in. A realm where fact and fiction collide. The Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. Hosted by Willie Miranda. Every Friday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. The one-hour show that will surely leave you hanging on the edge of the rabbit hole. The Paradigm Matrix. Explores a universe of topics from UFOs, cryptozoology, conspiracies, as well as all things paranormal. Enter a world of the twisted and deformed. Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Paradigm Matrix. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Where fact and fiction collide. Alien Deceptions. A suspenseful sci-fi romance thriller by Tina Marie. 
Featuring the tantalizing Erica Jones and the mysterious Russell Hamilton. An out-of-this-world book of fiction based on years of document facts and files the government does not want you to know about. At least, not yet. Alien Deceptions by Tina Marie. Available now at Amazon.com or get a signed copy at TinaMarieEntertainment.com. Get your copy now. 30 seconds and counting. Broadcasting to you from another planet. Beaming you a world of entertainment. This is the world famous KCOR. Now listen live online at KCORradio.com. I like everything about this station. When do I listen? Like 24 hours a day. It's my favorite station. I just love the music. It keeps me going at work. You're listening to what? You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. It is always with great sadness that I come back on my final segment for UFO Classified. I... I love being here. I could talk to my guests for hours and hours and hours, and I really I enjoy meet, meeting people and fostering relationships and hopefully getting good information out to the public. It's really imperative, especially now. And so every week when I bring a guest on, there is not a week where I'm bringing somebody on unless I really feel that they are of critical importance right now. Um, I am not the type of person that is going to bring on a person just because they're on the UFO lecture circuit. In fact, I probably won't bring you on if you are. I'm just saying. Um, But I think that there are people that are oftentimes behind the scenes that do great work. Barry Greenwood is one of those people, um, my mentor. There are lots of people that, that deserve to be heard and they need to be heard and they need to we need to get good information out my guest this evening is is david hogan and i love this book you need to go to amazon ufo facts all that's left to know about roswell aliens whirling discs and flying saucers that is a tongue twister but i love it and this (laughs) book has a bit of everything and and really in fact it just turned to a page entitled the roswell slide debacle that's clearly i'm gonna have to have you back on a few (laughs) different shows but you know you also Mm -hmm. talk about uh some of the ufo sightings back in the 19th century and you talk about i mean and those are fascinating you know it's this is um again this is just this there's a lot of meat to this book and i appreciate it and i also appreciate the fact that you know you are a skeptical believer and you did 18 months of research for this book and you feel that there are there are people that are not cranks that deserve to be heard or understood and that there is something of merit to this subject. And I, I, I like that. More skeptics should be like well, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I'm all throughout the show. Uh, 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 the two of us have mentioned NICAP. And the cool thing about NICAP is that they were not merely assembling or or aggregating um, information. Uh, they actively went out uh, to UFO scenes and investigated. And so how invested is that, huh? If you actually, you know, get in the car or on the plane and fly out and then chat with witnesses uh, and then think about what what those people have to say uh, and then add it to your database. Um, 
that's a heck of a service, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look back and I look back at some of the photos of, of Gordon and uh, Denault and, and, and people at NICAP, and I mean, they are, they're out there and they are dressed to the nines. I mean, they, this is professional. This is, um, yes. you know, it, it is, there was a level of integrity and professionalism that we just simply absolutely do not see today in the United States. Um. It's certainly become a casual society, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's funny. I, uh, uh, the other day I was looking at vintage archival footage of folks at a baseball game. Uh, I mean, uh, baseball is my favorite sport. I think it's the sport. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and so all these people, uh, I'm in the 1930s, and they're at the, uh, I'm at the ball yard, and they're in shirts and ties and hats, <laughs> and it's such a different, it's such a different era, and it was kind of constrained and probably, you know, a little limited in its thinking, but there was a seriousness about it that I think that you're alluding to, um, and that seriousness. I don't know, maybe it's been lost. Um, and so NICAP, uh, I mean, similar organizations, uh, 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 they certainly attempt to perpetuate that seriousness, attempted to perpetuate that seriousness. Um, uh, I want to believe and all this stuff, and 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 so be serious about it, and and that will encourage me and the broader public too. Um, uh, if I could just mention one of the heroes uh, I found, um, Ray Palmer. <laughs> Interesting fella, uh, the editor of Amazing Stories magazine in the 1940s. And he kind of took an unfortunate detour in the 40s. I mean, he hooked up with a steel worker named Richard Shaver. Shaver had this notion about the hollow earth and aliens. The Shaver mysteries, uh, yep. Yes, the Shaver mysteries, absolutely right, yeah. I mean, Ray Palmer was a very canny editor and I've held that role myself. And so I understand what is commercial and exploitable. And, 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 and so he just really rode the heck out of the shaver mystery stuff. But, uh, uh, after that, Ray Palmer founded, I'm um, actually co-founded Fate Magazine, and then later moved on to Mystic Magazine. I mean, now Ray Palmer is the guy who, I mean, this is in quotes, invented flying saucers. He made the idea broad and acceptable, uh, accessible, and. Uh, uh, he he had to cater to his readership, but he understood the excitement about uh, the UFO controversy. And so I don't really want to leave the show this evening uh, um, unless I, uh, I can mention Ray Palmer. I mean, he's been gone since about 1977, but um, just a fascinating fella. 
And there were so, and thank you for bringing that up because it just I it reminds me of you know when I go into my archive every day and I pull up some of of you know I mean all of all of this and it's just like oh my gosh and and Gray Barker and and some of these people and you mm-hmm. um, you know there and I want to ask you because we're getting low on time but there was some interesting when you mentioned Men in Black and you wrote about mm-hmm. that. There was there were a couple things in there that were quite interesting about uh, a professor, and so if you could just tell that story. Uh, the Men in Black phenomenon is uh, it's uh, it's so multifaceted. Um, it's political. It's psychological. Um, and, and, and I think there's even something very atavistic about it too. Um, and that these, uh, uh, presumed agents of, of whom, of the government, of alien civilizations, uh, you know, are moving among us and they're driving their, you know, black Fords with the dog, yeah, with the dog dish hubcaps, and they're in their black suits and and their hats and their sunglasses. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that Young would have been fascinated by the MIBs. Uh, you know, who are they? Uh, psychologically, what are they? Um. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're real or if they're uh, if they're apparitions out of our out of our subconscious. Um, but they're pretty darn interesting. Um, uh, if you look at them in a folkloric sense, you know, it's the, uh, you know, it's the omnipotent guardian come antagonist who is keeping an eye on us, uh, perhaps for our own good or maybe not. Um, I mean, the book, I talk about a particular um, incident at a, oh, a hotel or a motel, I mean, it was in Canada, I think. And uh, uh, how many fellows um, ended up being captured I'm on a surveillance camera? And they're looking for the manager of the hotel because other employees had seen a flock of UFOs a few nights earlier. And so they're roaming around the corridors. <laughs> And they're looking for the manager and they're chatting up other people. And, uh, you know, who the heck are these? Who are these guys? Uh, what do they want? Who sent them? Um, and, and they did reference young. Uh, I mean, there's something very, uh, Oh, atavistic about the MIBs. I mean, that they're often described I mean, as being not only in these dark suits and hats and sunglasses, but that they're very uh, uh, pale of complexion and uh, 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 kind of quietly and I'm intimidating. Uh, and so I don't know, after all of my research, if they're real, if they're symbolic, uh, if they're folkloric, you know, if, if, if they're just somebody named Fred, I'm mean, the, uh, 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 who are they? Right. And, and, you know, I mean, sometimes you get, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of paranoia and so you get some of that, but I mean, you, you know, I've had Nick Redford on my show has written several books about the men in black and there's some very eerie, Encounters, uh, according to to some witnesses, and I have to just throw this out there, but there was actually uh, an MIB 
case back in the 60s that Nick told me about where that involved a, a Ford Galaxy, several Ford Galaxies. I just thought, you know, that, hey, that's your car. I know. How cool is that? You have a I, Ford Galaxy. I know. What does it mean? <laughs> there, there could be something a little creepy about both of the, you know, the combination <laughs> of me and the Ford Galaxy and the Men in Black. But, but it is, it is, um, you know, all of this is is fascinating right now with Skinwalker Ranch and that whole Uinta Basin. There have been, you know, there are myths swirling around or stories swirling around about the Men in Black and all of these things. And are they, you know, I mean, they're they're was, as you note in your book, the, uh, the government, our government, was interested in men in black because there were people who were pretending to be involved with the military, uh, yeah. and they were questioning witnesses. And so there was a point in time when that was a very real uh, concern for them. Will you? Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, I still don't know if he if every man in black isn't just a hobbyist, (laughs) you know, or a fattest, uh, or if he is a representative of the government or even of a larger um, institution. Uh, uh, I, I personally have a problem with the whole idea of MIB, uh, because it is so symbolic and folkloric, um, and archetypal. Uh, um, it's like something out of a, out of a grim fairy tale. Uh, it's this implacable figure. I'm um, in black, uh, uh, literally in black. And uh, it's a sort of a of a shared consciousness kind of thing. Uh, I mean, again, it brings us back to Jung. Uh, you know, it's it's the threatening other. It's the authority figure. It's the investigator who who uh, uh, has no sympathy for us at all. And just curious about this and that that we may have witnessed. Um, uh, I think of all of the things that I discuss in that 170,000 word book, I had the most difficulty reconciling the men in black. Um, I I can't quite get a handle on them. You know, are they mythic? Are they real? Are they both? Uh, I imagine that you've thought about them a lot. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, you know what? It, it's so hard because there's so many areas to study. And, you know, I mean, for me, my my area of study, I, I've really kind of honed in uh, on anomalous like phenomena and going to different places and doing field research. And so my my bailiwick is that it is not the men in black. And I think it's fascinating and I want to learn more. And we have had uh, sightings uh, or reports of sightings in the Uinta Basin. So it's definitely something to think about. Um and uh, it, I don't, there's just, you know, there's so many roads to go down and we've got about three mm. minutes left to the show. And I, I want oh. to ask you what you think about To the Stars Academy and, you know, now all of these news, uh, you know, outlets reporting the Navy's, sight, you know, sightings of, of objects and things. I mean, is this anything new? Should we be excited by this quote unquote disclosure? What are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a bit of a renaissance, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's redolent of uh, uh, of years past, I think. <clears throat> and then you sort of inquiry, uh, and then you sort of curiosity. That's a good thing. And uh, um, I think all of us can figure out later if this stuff conforms to the scientific method. Uh, but for now, I mean, it's exciting. I mean, it certainly excites me. 
um, uh, uh, partly because uh, uh, the people involved are uh, you know steady eddy types, uh, and 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 they're just curious about these things, <clears throat> and 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 they are. I'm interested in this new wave of uh, <clears throat> of sightings. Um, uh, and now that being said, you know I did learn as I did the book that sightings often correspond to the tenor of the times. <clears throat> and I did allude to this earlier, you know, uh, uh, but politically, we are in a rather unorthodox period. <clears throat> and so is it that that's encouraging this new wave of sightings? Uh, are we uneasy? You know, are we you know, are hopeful about answers from elsewhere? Um, I think the UFO phenomenon in general, it's all about psychology, really. Uh, and there is hard science involved and observation and eyewitnesses, you know, it's physical evidence. But ultimately, it's a lot about the culture that produces these things. Uh, and uh, we are at a very peculiar and unique moment in the culture. And perhaps that is contributing to this new wave of interest and sightings. Right. And, and you, when you say that, you bring up something, I mean, I, I've, you know, Barry Greenwood is a, a friend of mine and we talk a, a lot and he has mentioned, you know, how, how different countries have different types of UFO sightings that they're seeing. So South America, there yeah, were you bet. ships, you know, yes, with, yes, yes. Uh, you know, like a, like some, like a fish hook being thrown uh, or a line mm -hmm. being thrown off and, and all of these things. And so when you look at different geographic regions, I mean, it's all, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's just freaking fascinating. You're seeing different types of entities in different countries at different time periods. And I mean, oh my gosh, you could just go on and on in this subject forever. And it, there's a lot of subjectivity involved. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. yeah. And I just, I, that's why I'll never get bored of, of looking into this and hearing people's experiences. No, I don't either. Oh my gosh, I love it, I love it, I love it. And you're doing a new project, you're involved in a new project, and I'll be I'm very excited to mm -hmm. see how that unfolds. And so we've got like three minutes yeah. to close, but give us a little teaser about your new project. Well, uh, I started reading comic books in 1958, and, and I started collecting them in 1965. And I am very interested in the 1950s. I'm an editor-in-chief and a contributing writer. I did a book a few years back called The 50s Chronicle. It is my favorite decade. I'm a child of the 50s. And so I had this notion, uh, uh, let's do a history of the 1950s as expressed through the covers of comic books of the 1950s. Um, and now, whether or not the artists and editors consciously understood that they were expressing their time period, they did. And so there's questions about teen sex and the myth of the Old West and the Red Scare uh, and single mothers, uh, adultery, uh, the hot rod culture, the rebel image, and 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 it's all there in these beautifully graphic covers of comic books from the 1950s. And so I am working up a proposal right now on that, 
and I'm just having a lot of fun. That is so cool. I love that. I love it. And we didn't even talk about your fascination with classic cars and, you know, the American West. There's so much more to talk to you about. (laughs) This has been a delightful interview. Thank you so much for for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, and I will post post the, the, again, the link to to your books. And thank you for writing this. And thanks for being here. Next week, I will have uh, Don Schmidt here. And this is going to be a great interview. I've been talking with him we have some information uh some some things that we would like to to get out there and i'll be very excited to have him here finally he's never been on the show he'll be here next week but stick around for willie miranda he is going to be here right you know in five minutes talking with jorge martin about enigmas of the millennia ufo the ufo phenomena in puerto rico it should be a great night i love tina marie thank you for being here thank you for your support and we will do this together this is an important topic and i enjoy the ride so have a safe weekend and we'll catch you next week Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Luke's upcoming guests as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack.